All right, well, I'm Deborah Hill, and I'm the communications strategist at the World Food Policy Center. And this is a research center that's in the public policy school at Duke University. And I'm going to be producing podcasts for the Alliance. It's my great pleasure. I'm very excited about it. And what I want to do in today's presentation is to give you a good understanding of how the whole podcasting system works and the different elements of it so that you know a little bit more about the role that you're going to play as the, an interviewer and then also the partnership that you and I would have in crafting a podcast. So the first thing I want to do is say that data does not change people's minds or behavior. It's unfortunate, but we need to know this as we're starting to plan out our podcasts. And so what does work? Really the things that make a difference in helping people be in a position to change their mind on things or to take in a position that maybe they haven't thought about before are stories and emotional connection and then a little bit of data. And so as we're planning our podcasts and we're developing the podcast as part of an overall campaign to support the goals of the Alliance, we want to keep this in mind. So I want to go through the steps that are in the creation of the podcast so that you understand how it all goes together. So you're going to have a pre-interview process where you're going to talk with the guest, you're going to do some coaching, you're going to do some collaborative scripting and story narrative development so that the guest is fully prepared to answer the questions in a concise way. Then of course we'll have the interview process itself, which will be done remotely. And that interview will include the interviewee, the guest, and then also myself as the producer. And what I'll be doing is listening for those sort of noisy bits and, and the coughs and the, the overlap sounds and the accidental things that are going to influence the quality of the podcast. So I can say, hey, we need to stop and we need to redo that part again. Then there'll be editing and production, which will primarily be something that I'll do. And then we have the finished piece which will then post to syndication, meaning that'll go out to a variety of different podcast apps, and then we'll do promotion, both as individuals and then the Alliance itself will do promotion. And then once the piece is officially out and available, we also have the opportunity to think about how to use it in long-term campaigns. And so we want to use the time that we've invested in the podcast in a way that's the most productive way possible, and that's by reusing it whenever we can. So now let's go into the pre-interview and guest coaching process. So you do need to have a conversation with your guest <clears throat> ahead of time. And the, the, the big part of this is really to create a comfortable rapport with that person. And, and I know a lot of you are already, already going to know your guests, and that's great. So then you want to try to agree on really the focus of what the interview is going to be about. And it's extremely helpful to uh, agree on three to five questions that are gonna be the basis of the interview. And you can ask additional questions that just naturally come out of the conversation that you're happening during the interview, but you do want to have three to five identified ahead of time. So that again, that guest has an opportunity to really decide what examples they want to use, to decide what phrasing they want to use, and to be able to figure out how they wanna say it in the most concise way possible. We are going to need a photograph, preferably high res, and a bio for each guest. We need the photographs because they actually become then the thumbnail that's on the podcast itself on all of the apps. And then you would set a time and a date for the interview. And you'll need to coordinate with me as the producer to make sure that I'm available as well since I'm on all of the calls. And then just a heads up, we do use a, a remote program, which means that both you and the guest are going to need to use wired earbuds or headphones that have a mic. And that can be something like mine, like what I have right now, or it can be as simple as what you get with your cell phone, the little earbuds with the mic that's on the line. Those actually work spectacularly. And when in our own show, we send people that, that quality level. We just send them a pair in order to be able to do it. I know that the Alliance isn't gonna have the resources to do that, but just let people know that they can use their headphones or earbuds that came with their phone as well. But you do need to be wired into either your cell phone or your computer. And then let the guests know to look for an email from a program called Ringer. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. So you also want to do some coaching with the guest. Stories and examples are what keep people listening. Think about some of the best um, like NPR 
episodes that you've listened to or other podcasts. And it's really the stories and the examples that keep people excited and interested in continuing on through the whole rest of the podcast. And the order of information is actually really important. Academics in particular tend to tell stories almost in a backward order. And so they'll do detail, 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 and then they'll give you sort of the summarizing picture. But for the listener, that's really frustrating because they don't know where you're going. They don't, they don't know how to take that information in and give context. And so you want to remind people to sort of give that big picture idea first and then give the supporting detail with story and narrative if possible and a little bit of data. We want to try to shoot for between 10 and 15 minute episodes. That's not set in stone. I will tell you that when we first started our show, we were doing between 20 and 25 minutes. And we started to get comments from people saying, we love your show, we love the topics, we love the guests, but it's too long for me. And so we did some sort of uh, checking with other people who were doing podcasts and the sort of golden spot is between 10 and 15 minutes. So just keep that in mind. And then I want to let both you know and for you to let your guests know that we want to try to make this as low stress of a recording environment as possible. So if you flub something up, if you cough, if you forget something, if you want to redo something, it's not a problem. Just pause for a second and say, hey, I need to do this over or I, I want to say something else or can I clarify that point? And I'll be able to edit out all those other bits. And then to try to find the quietest possible location for the recording. And I mean, really, as quiet as you can possibly get it. Because there are some things I just will not be able to edit out of the soundtrack. And then to try not to fiddle with your desk, um, not to move papers, not to make rustling, because those sounds actually get picked up. Um, these mics are incredibly sensitive. And it does make a difference in the overall listening quality for the people that are going to be listening to the podcast. So now I want to talk a little bit about collaborative scripting for story narrative. So you do actually want to fully write out the script and you want to use the same intro and ending language for each podcast. And I think that's something that the communications group is working on right now. And part of the reason for, for being standardized in that is most podcast shows actually have a single interviewer and you get to know that person over time. But we're not, we're not going to have that. We're going to have a bunch of different people actually playing the role of the interviewer, which is great. But we want for the listeners not to feel like they're in a completely new experience every time they listen to one of our podcasts. And so that standardized intro and closing really makes a difference for the user. It sort of lessens the amount of energy they have to put into this. We want to create interesting an interesting experience for the listener. So you want to, whenever possible, queue up the interviewee's great stories. And you'll know what those are because you've done the pre-interview. And then use the guest's first name when it makes sense to create a sense of intimacy and as if you're talking to the person in the same room. It actually makes them more relaxed and it's, it just creates a better experience for the listener. Try not to do these things. Don't recite a long bio listing of awards, professorships, affiliations, etc. Give just enough information for us to know where that person's from in the initial introduction. And then if there are important things about that person's experience that we really want the listener to know, then find a way to work those into the setup for the question. And I'll actually show you an example of that in just a second. And then also please help me as the producer by not letting a guest just drone on, hoping I can fix it in the editing. I can chop up long dialogues and make them shorter, but it's better if the host or if the guest really has an opportunity to concisely say what they want to say. And they themselves have said it with their emotion and inflection rather than me trying to, to create that by chopping things up. And so you may need to, or even I as a producer might need to break in and say, this is a little bit longer than we can do for a podcast. Can you do that answer again and do it a little more concisely? So now I want to walk you through the anatomy of what a, uh, a script would look like for a podcast. So there's going to be the standard podcast and the interviewer introduction, which we've just talked about. That intro needs to include the topic and the guest. And then there's going to be some welcome banter between you and your guest. Then we're going to get into the questions, the thank you banter, and the standard closing. And so I want to show you what that looks like for our show, the show that I do for the Duke World Food Policy Center. So our standard intro looks roughly like this. 
immediately I'm laying out what the name of the podcast is and I'm identifying who the host is. I'm telling people what the topic is and I'm getting right into who my guest is and then boom, the welcome banter and then the interview begins. You really don't want to have long, long, long intros because the guests or the listeners are trying to experience this. They want to hear the dialogue. And so we don't want to be lecturing them. We want them to hear conversation. But this is what a standard intro typically looks like for, for our show. And then here's what the questions tend to look like. So here you can see we're, we're actually planning in using the guest's first name. We're setting up a question by giving a little bit of background and then we're going into the question itself. Here, this particular guest had some incredibly relevant experience that gives her a lot of authority and we wanted people to know that. So we actually worked in some of her bio background into the setup for this question. And then again, we asked the question. So your script is going to look a lot like this. And then a standard closing would be something like this, where you thank the person and you have that thank you banter. You re-identify who the guest was. You thank people for listening and tell them where to find the podcast series. And we don't really find it super effective to actually list out URLs, but if you just say, you know, you can find the podcast on the website of the, and I'm not sure really what our, our I'm not sure really what our alliance website URL is going to be, but anyway, just state it out and then let's, let them know what they're going to find. They're going to find both podcasts and transcripts and then re-identify the host and boom, you're out. So that's roughly what, it gives you a sense of how to create a script, I guess is what I'm trying to show you. Now for the interview itself, I'd like for both you and the guests to, uh, to log in just a few minutes early because sometimes we have technical issues. And this could be something like someone hasn't enabled their microphone or we're having some internet connection issues, but it's helpful to just log in a little bit early. And then we'll, we should, the three of us, the, the guest, the interviewer, and me as the producer, we should just chat with the person just a little bit because it kind of calms them down. And there's genuinely a difference in the timbre of their voice when we've allowed them to talk for a minute in a low stress, stress environment. And what I tend to do is when we're just having that sort of chatty banter, is I'll go ahead and turn on the recording so that they don't freak out when they know that the recording starts. And then we want to do these at a pretty relaxed and friendly pace. You're gonna follow the script, but you do want to modulate your voice. You've all listened to a presentation where someone's just reading it and you can tell. And that's not what we wanna do on a podcast. You really want to hear the person's, uh, the person's emotion. We need to hear you as an interviewer. We need to hear your voice, your real voice, not your reading voice. So think about reading a story to your kids. Like you want to sort of overanimate just a little bit. And then as a reminder, you don't need to do everything perfect from start to finish. We can stop. We can restart again. We can re-ask a question again. And sometimes we have a, a, a guest that, that is just providing such incredible information that then we'll stop and we have the host actually ask a question that would have queued that up so that we have all the context we need to piece together the, the final show. And that's, a, that's an easy thing to do. Consider pausing after each question to evaluate. And this is, this is something that sometimes I will do, but it's a little bit better if the host does. And what we wanna do is if someone has just really not answered a question very well, or if they flub something and we know we re need to re-record, or if they just, you know, just really went a different way than what we're expecting, we can stop and say, hey, I don't think that quite worked well enough for us to actually use. Let's do that again. And then the host would re-ask the question and give the guest a chance to re-answer. You do obviously have the opportunity to ask additional questions that just naturally come up as a part of the conversation. That's perfectly fine. Um, again, what, which we will be cognizant of the amount of time that the ultimately end show is going to be, but it's fine to ask those additional questions. And then stay on the line until the audio has completely uploaded. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Is there any questions so far? I'm kind of banging through this at a, at a quick speed. Okay. So now editing production, and that's mostly something that I'm going to be doing, but I want you to see the back end a little bit so that you understand. So when we're recording, we're going to be using a program called Ringer. And so I will 
schedule the conversations through Ringer, and then you and the guest will both receive an email from Ringer that has connection codes in it. And that's what you would use to join the recording with me. I will go in and log in directly to Ringer and turn on the recording as the host, excuse me, as the producer. So then the next step would be editing an Adobe Audition. And this is what that typically looks like. And so all these little delete audios over here on the left, that's taking out all the ums and the pauses that don't make sense and audio that doesn't make sense and all of the chatter that we might have saying, let's redo that one or that's not quite right. So this is what this looks like when we do that. Then there's a transcription process where we send off the finished recording that's been edited. We send that off to be transcribed and we need that for two things. We're actually going to be creating audiograms out of these podcasts, and so it acts like a movie, even though it's just the podcast. And so we have to have a, what's called an SRT file, meaning that there's closed captions. And so this rev.com creates the closed captions and then also gives us the transcript that we can post on the website. And you want to do the transcript because it actually makes this information more findable on search engines. And that's going to boost the likelihood that people who are interested in the topic and who are looking for this kind of content will be able to find our podcast. So then the next step would be some packaging on my part. And this is where I'm going to use a program called Headliner. And I take the audio and I take the visual images that we've created, which is typically the it's typically just the picture of the guest and I'm going to create the audiogram and I use this headliner program to do it. And these audiograms, when you play them, you'll be able to see people's voice move. It's a simple thing, but it just makes it a little bit more visual and it makes it something that we can post on YouTube, which is an incredibly important channel, I think, for what you're trying to do. And the next step would be posting it to the websites and social media and syndicating it out through the podcast apps. And so here's an example of some of the ones that we've posted on our own uh, YouTube site. Now, the initial podcast syndication and promotion, we're going to have, uh, we're going to use a program that's called Libsyn, and that's going to send it out to places like Google Play, um, Apple Podcasts, to Stitcher, Radio Public. We'll actually decide which ones of those we want to use, and once they're set up, then Libsyn will syndicate that out. We'll post that on the Global Alliance website when we get that up to our YouTube channel and to social media. And then at that point, we can start to promote the podcast um, in the hand-to-hand -hand combat way, meaning that the different Alliance members would send that out to their personal networks. You'd post it on LinkedIn, you might post it on your Facebook, and then I'm, I'm hoping that the Alliance would be developing a mailing list over time of people that are interested in these perspectives, and then we would send it out to them as well. So there's some decisions that we've got to make as a team that we that, that are not fully clear to me how we're going to do it. Like who would be the on the alliance side, the Uber coordinator for the podcast series, and that's the person who would be in charge of the editorial calendar, meaning that we have an interviewer and a guest identified. We've got them scheduled, and it's going to happen. That is maybe sort of the coach for our hosts on doing the scripts. Um, I would recommend that we do a teaser podcast that helps to introduce the series. Almost all of the podcast channels actually have a place for you to have a teaser podcast, meaning that one always shows up as the first option to listen to. And so I think it'd be worthwhile for us to do one that really kind of tees up what you're trying to do, uh, maybe some of the key messages that were in the manifesto. So we should talk about that as a group, too, and figure out what we want to do. And then uh, who's going to be in charge of doing the email outreach? Who's going to post it to a website and social media? And then we need to agree on the standardized language for the intro and closing so that we can share that out with each host and they can incorporate that into their podcast. And that is a very speedy way to say it's podcasting. And so now I just would like to stop the share and, and have this be open to questions and we can have a good dialogue about how to go about doing this. Hi, I was just wondering about the program, the other program with um, used with Ringer. Mm -hmm. What was the name of that program again? So I, so Ringer is the program. Is that what oh, you're asking about? Part of Ringer? Or, or which program were you asking about? The one that actually creates the audiograms? I think so, yeah, yeah. 
That's yeah, so Headliner. Headliner yeah. is the program that, that you send. You put the you put your audio file in it and also yeah. put an image and then it creates the it's a movie file, it's an MP4 file that then you can post on YouTube. And so it's headliner. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, quick question as well. So in terms of I know we were looking um to do I think it's 10 to 15 minutes for the length. Um mm -hmm how long would like recording an actual interview be versus like the amount you would need to cut down? Yeah, when we do our recordings for our show, it typically takes about a half an hour. And then depending upon how well the interview went and how smoothly each person speaks, it could take me anywhere from maybe four to five hours to two days to do the editing. Yeah, we had started to to have a discussion about you know what happens if we've particularly if we've got two interviewees two guests um and maybe you know it's worth considering separating the interviews if we feel that 15 minutes is you know not going to be enough time to to capture the the many things that those people might might have to say and sure. um, suzanne and i for example have been wondering you know if you start to have a conversation that's really developing at 15 minutes you know is it worth carrying on recording and potentially having longer versions that people could access so to, you can have great energy when you have multiple guests and what you want to do for that is actually sort of do a little bit of pre-planning to who's going to answer which question who's going to answer it first how do you want to how are you going to do that handoff from from one guest to the next guest so that everybody is sort of prepared uh, and so that's just going to be, again, a part of the scripting. Or if you haven't had a chance to do that before the start, we can do that when we have everybody together for the interview itself. And we'll say, okay, let's go through the questions. Who's going to answer it first? Um, is, are, you, are you both going to answer both? And sometimes they don't want to. Sometimes they've already sort of pre-decided, no, that's my question. This is your question. If you've got great dialogue going on and it's going longer than a 30-minute recording, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say just kill it and, and stop the recording, keep going. Um, because we can potentially make two. And then also as you're doing the pre-interviews, make a decision as to whether or not you think you really do have two distinct podcasts. Because we can just do two recordings with the guests when we have them on. And we'll, we'll frequently do that for our show too, when we have particularly a very high profile guest, is we'll just do two podcasts at, at the same interview. And just and just restart over with the intro language and and do the second podcast so that's a that's an easy thing to do and and honestly i'd rather see you do two podcasts than to have a longer podcast and to have people drop off because they've run out of time you know and they just don't have 30 minutes 20 minutes more to be able to listen to it all. i'd rather have you do two podcasts with amazing guests than to just do one and maybe lose some listeners and most people, honestly, are more than they're, they're more than willing to do two podcasts, and they understand that you're just going to do the intro language again and, and queue up the second one. It can be a great a great way to get some good content. So just to follow up, Deborah, when you talk about the script, that is just sort of from the interviewer's side, correct? Mm -hmm. Or am I also sort of trying to, in my conversation with the guests, I've also sort of got a sense of what they're going to say and that becomes part of it but no it's just it's a, from the it's, interviewer side it's a little bit of both actually because in the pre-interview you and the guests will get a sense of of really what makes the most sense to ask now i'm sure that you could come up with the questions entirely on your own without doing the pre-interview but what we find is that the guests actually are able to come up with those just laser focused questions that get you right to the heart of the matter quicker mm -hmm. and that it's just really worthwhile for for you to sort of come to that agreement sometimes we will actually share our script in its entirety with the guest and if you have time to do that that's great and again it helps sort of reinforce for them this is how it's going to flow this is what i'm going to answer um, and it does reduce their stress and i think make them more comfortable as a speaker on the podcast because they feel prepared and they they know what's going to happen so that's a great thing to do if you have the time to do it yeah i think we've circled around the conversation a little bit about um you know trying to design a series that covers a lot of issues without trying to um predicts what people are going to say to be able to allow 
the guests to, 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 to give us their questions, you know, the questions that they most want to, to answer and the stories that they most want to foreground. So I think that's something that we've kind of been back and forthing a little bit, but I think, I think it should organically develop as well as we, you know, collect the interviews and maybe issues will realize that we haven't been discussing this particular issue. And so I'm mm -hmm. hoping that we can go between we, the two. We do a little bit of forecasting in our show too. Like I might reach out to someone and say, I'm really interested in doing a podcast that has this kind of a focus. And I might even describe what kind of a story arc I'm looking for. For example, we're doing a series right now on how COVID is affecting the food system in North Carolina, for example. And so I'm reaching out to people and I'm saying, I'm really interested in doing a story on this. I, I feel like you could bring this kind of a context in. And they'll either say, yeah, boy, I'm really having issues with this. And immediately it becomes this great collaborative conversation or the, or they might, and I've never, I don't think I've ever had this happen. They might say, you know, I just really don't have a lot to talk about on that particular topic, but I'm really passionate about this and I really think we need to make change in this area and then they might go off into their own direction. So let people know. I mean, let people know what you're trying to do if you're trying to create a particular series or if you're just doing a podcast because they're a player in this field, that's also fine. You can go back and re-record something that says this is a part of a series of podcasts on such and such a topic. It's not always just set in stone. But I think as much context as you can give your guest, that's helpful for them. And they'll want to know, like, who's your audience for this? Who are you trying to influence with this piece? And that's something that, that I think we as the Alliance need to be able to say. You know, we're, we're not trying to convince the convinced, or are we? I don't know. Are we trying to convince policymakers? Like, who would you really say is the audience for the podcast? Because letting the guest know that as well helps them to choose their language in a way that would be most effective, to choose the examples and the stories that'll be most effective. I was, you know, I remember Rebecca mentioning that it would be really useful to be able to play some of the episodes to people who are working in the food provision system, you know, who might not have thought of some, some of the different perspectives. So to try to make it, and that, that's one of the appeals, I think, of the short shorter form that you, you know people don't have to sign up to a, a really long listen um so i think that's definitely one of the the key audiences is to try and build you know an alliance that's you know from the ground up that's not not just targeted at policymakers. and i think you're going to have a lot of different kinds of podcasts like you're going to have some some podcasts perhaps with people who are just really leading edge activists and and that's their emphasis you're going to have some other podcasts that are just maybe much, much, much more about the lived experiences of people who are struggling with food insecurity. You see the difference between those two, you know? So I think you're going to have a really wide range potentially, um, and that's going to allow you to use them in different ways. And it's, you know, people have a lot to offer through podcasting, I think. Um, I think it's a great medium to be able to really quickly get people in front of others, so to speak, that they wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to interact with, to be able to get a lot of the top research thoughts on policy and transitions and change and conflict and food security, you know, to be able to get that, those people talking to a broad audience that they might otherwise not be able to engage with. I think that's amazing. It's great. I have a question about um, opening the episodes. Um, so my understanding we is we have like a sort of standard interview preamble that uh, gets to the point, and I think that would work well. Uh, but considering we're in su in such different locations, um, would it be possible to take some time to include like a sort of descriptive passage to set the scene and 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 ground ground the episode? So yeah, that actually is a part of the topic introduction for the okay. podcast itself absolutely yeah okay thanks and then also look for opportunities to sort of set the scene i like that framing that you just used to set the scene in the questions mm -hmm. each individual question that's great i think um there's also this question around the teaser because we'd written we'd sort of 
coalesced around this quite long description that Deb Deborah was like, no, it's really long. <laughs> it needs to be much shorter. And then I thought, could that be part of a sort of yes. blurb, like an introductory? So would that be what you'd see as the teaser? Yeah. That, that that episode would be where we can have a bit of a longer, more like a manifesto. Yeah. But maybe with exactly. some different voices from around the alliance. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, I think that would be the perfect thing to do. You just, you just could not expect a listener to sit through something like that each time they were going to listen to the podcast. Yeah, that's a no. You know, they just won't do it. You know, you wouldn't want to do it either. But there is a place for that and helping them to understand who you are. Um, and, and maybe that longer preamble, I think, that you sent me is more of a, of a who you are piece than it is. So you need to think of that teaser as the marketing piece for the podcast. You know, people are not going to listen to something because they're made to feel like they should listen to it. They should care about it. They're just not going to do that. That teaser for the podcast series has got to be something that makes them think, oh, you know, I'm curious about this now. You've made me curious and I want to know really what this is all about. That might not be the same as the preamble. The preamble might be more of an about us page on your website. And that, that's where that might be. And it's great to do that as a, as a audio recording to make that available in that way. Um, but we'll, we'll figure it out as we really sort of dig into the language on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. I know just from experience listening to podcasts, I hate the preamble. And I want to get to the person who's being interviewed right away. I mean, so I, and I, I think that's not just me. I think it's, it's everyone. Um, and so we've got to try and be really succinct in both that intro, but also the preamble. That can't be too long either. And I like your strategy of sort of maybe even introducing those scenes or more information about the person in the context of the interview itself rather than putting it all in the front. Yeah. So what would you recommend as sort of a, a time? So if, if it's a 10 minute podcast, how much time upfront spent on sort of the chatter and all of that and the preamble and uh, intro? I think you really should be starting to have the guest start to speak within a minute. Okay. Yeah. That like that's how fast you should be, just bang, 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 getting right into it. Because the real, the real, um, you can give so much context just in the way that you set up each question, that you don't need to do it all up front. And and I think that's what we really want to try to do. And and Charlie, you know, it might make sense for us at least for a little while until this starts to take its own shape, and and people can really tell. This is how we do it. It might make sense for us to sort of collaboratively do some of these scripts together to sort of make the balance is in the right place. And I'm happy to do that too. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, it's, it's more work, but I was wondering if it might be useful to practice interviewing each other using the platforms at all. I, I, I actually think that's a really good idea because it's a different experience. And if you haven't done it before, it's human nature for you to have a stress response and you need to then be able to hear your voice and to be able to hear, Oh, I don't even sound like myself. I sound really uptight or I'm speaking so fast. What's going on here. So I think it would be worthwhile for everyone to do that. And you're right. It would take a little bit of time, but it's the right kind of investment to make in order for us to have a really solid podcast. It's worth the time. I think it's always worth it. I'd um, jumped the gun and with Suzanne, you know, pushed the scheduling of um, our interview with Paul Taylor and, and Heber Brown. Um, so Su Suzanne, I just want to say sorry for being rushy about that because I also didn't think to include you, Deborah, as the producer because like that bit about, you know, including you in the emails to make sure that we do the scheduling is, 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 is an important part of it. So um, my bad on, on rushing no things, problem. No problem. but I think we can still manage it. Yeah. Um, See, normally you would have both people in the same room and the producer is also there. And the producer, so this is what I do and what the producer does is you're taking notes all the way along through. And then at the end, or even sometimes interrupting the actual flow and going into it is, is you might interrupt and say, you know, okay, we, we need to record, re-record this again. Or can you say that, but shorter, you know, this type of thing. So sometimes when you have somebody who's really, really super, super anxious, it is it's really helpful for them if we break in after each question and say, how do you feel about that? Did, did that feel comfortable? Did you get to say everything the way that you wanted to say it? And, and sometimes they're like, well, you know, I don't know whether I kind of wandered off in here. And, and, and then it becomes, they're a part of the collaborative process as opposed to being in the spotlight. And, and that, I find that to be really helpful in helping some guests to settle down. 
because it is a little nerve wracking. Do you all know if you're planning to release podcasts on a, a regular schedule or more as developed? Because that adds a huge amount of stress to whoever's going to be the Uber coordinator for this on the Alliance side. And it adds a little bit of stress to ensuring that you do have stuff lined up. I think that's one of the key maybe concerns we've been struggling with, right? Who has the time and resources to do that? I know that for me has been a big concern. Um, and I was actually going to ask you, you know, so the Uber coordinator, they do a bulk of the job, right? Because that scheduling can take a massive amount of time. Um, but then the scripting is done. I assume that the scripting was done between the interviewer and the interviewee in the pre using the pre-interview, is that correct? Or yep, does the yep, coordinator yep. play a yep. role in that as well? Um, they could, and they and we might want that to happen in the beginning, just to ensure that the structure of the podcast is gonna follow the best practice principles that we talked about. So it could okay. be that way, yeah. Okay. And so, you know, it depends on really how you're wanting to, so I, I don't know that I really, re, I, I don't really have a good sense yet of what kinds of podcasts we're going to be starting with. There, there, there needs to be some foundation pieces, meaning these are going to be like your real evergreen foundation podcasts that people don't know anything about. What do you mean right to food? What does that even mean? I don't, I, I, of course I have a right to feed. I'm a human being. I mean, they're not even going to understand what you're talking about. So they, there's going to be some that are just purely about helping them to understand purely educational and then they're going to be some that are maybe trying to move them towards a emotional order or an intellectual position on a topic you know and then there's going to be some that are just really about more current event type this is happening in the world and you should know and it relates to food and food policy and here's how you can get involved in your local food council or where whatever it is that you're going to be saying so I guess what I'm saying is I don't think it's something to be really stressed out about if you don't do like one a week or, or one every two weeks or, you know, you know, I think if you did one every three weeks or every four weeks that that's also going to be fine because at least for a while, most of your listeners are going to be people that you are contacting directly through your personal networks as you, and then you're going to be trying to build up that audience on the podcast app. Charlie and Audrey, you've been sort of leading us in this uh, initiative. What were your thoughts about time and how often you want to, or we should be doing this? Did you have any? Um, Audrey, feel free to jump in with your thoughts. Um, I don't have a particularly strict, uh, you know, I was thinking every two or three weeks would be great if we can and it kind of depends on the capacity of the people who are interviewing because we've got this kind of dispersed interviewee thing I mean in my head the scheduling would be done between the interviewer and the guest as well including mm -hmm. depth so I I've got a little confusion over the you know the role of the uber coordinator there but I also feel like there needs to be the sense that we've got like a collective document or space to be keeping track of some of these things just to make sure that all of the jobs are done that's the mm -hmm. bit that's been stressing me out a little bit is like how do we you know share out the tasks but make sure that you know all of the bases are covered yeah and that's the um, coordinator that's the uber coordinator and they're going to make sure that a host has been identified and that a topic has been identified and that the topic is something that the communications group says yep we want to go there that's a part of our message that's a part of our our core identity and what we want to do and then the uber coordinator you know tells the host we probably want to get this recorded within the next four weeks and then the host needs to take it from there with the identified guest Okay, that's helpful. And just we've we've been trying to do some stuff on on the Google Doc um, so far and on Slack. Although you know Slack's been having a bit of a challenge with the with the take up, but the um, the link in the chat that's kind of where we've had this basic episode plan to try and keep a track of some of the people that you know might be interviewing there, who might be interviewed. That's kind of open to change and open to for people to you know play around with. But um, I guess that's been our kind of so far the holding space for trying to have a bit of a, a plan i don't know yeah. Audrey, if you've got any particular thoughts on timing and yeah i agree with charlie i think it mostly depends on availability since it seems like a lot of people are really busy right now but i think at like once every few weeks sounds good if that's possible yeah i think so but you do you do need to have someone who's playing that sort of editorial oversight role 
and that's helping to ensure that we do have slots assigned in essence and that the guest and the topic are aligned with what the alliance is trying to do because uh, it's unlikely that it will self-assemble in a timely way that someone will just say okay i know it's my time to do october and and just self-assemble into that you will need someone who's helping to ensure that your editorial calendar stays somewhat full so that you're creating so it won't happen this way but this is what the way that you want to think about it you want to think about the fact that in this first podcast you're going to capture somebody's thoughts and then how do you want to educate them with each additional podcast of course no one person is probably going to do that but when you think about an audience that way it helps you get a sense of the order that you should do things and how you want to set things up what topics you need to try to cover you could also take the strategy of you're going to do a handful of your evergreen foundation pieces. You could do some of those up front so that so that those are some of the first ones that are put out. And those then would be used with other campaigns that the Alliance might be doing to help draw people to the principles that you're trying to promote. So the podcast isn't just a standalone thing. It needs to be a tool that's a part of your whole toolbox of things that the Alliance is using and trying to change. Well, I'm, you know, happy to keep trying to do the sort of calendrical oversight or whatever, um, or to, you know, move towards ways that we, you know, can be sure that we're doing things right and to, to get to a process. But I also feel like, you know, it'd be nice to, to check in with everybody once in a while and have a sort of editorial board kind of approach where yeah, we can all be great. checking in on this, like, yes. what is our collective voice? Because I think the Alliance has still been, you know, we don't have that we have different views within the Alliance and it would be good, I think, to be checking in um, once we've listened to some of the recordings and to be, you know, getting together to, 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 to check in on the direction and this sort of editorial tone that's coming out. If, if, if that sounds good with people, if we could, you know, have a like a subgroup of the Alliance, I guess, a little offshoot um, so that everyone's got a chance to pitch in and, and say what what they think about what's what's been happening. I think that'd be great. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, and I feel like Charlie and Audrey, you've already, you know, in that document, I think you've put forth a pretty solid, I think, vision of, um, of sort of the different episodes. And so for me, that sort of editorial kind of guidance, maybe one of the things that is not there, or maybe I missed it, is sort of more of those foundational pieces. Um, and maybe we just need to put some of those down there as well because we could start the conversation with COVID and how that affects um, food insecurity, but then what's the larger, it, it, it doesn't fit with that larger theme that we even starting out with that intro with, you know what I mean? So maybe the first one needs to be food charity and the problems with it. Um, and that's sort of a foundational piece. Another one might be food and health and you know, maybe we get uh, you know, an expert to, um, to speak to that. And, and I'm not sure if we want to, and maybe once we get maybe a couple of foundational pieces, then we start doing interviews and then we sort of intersperse the rest of them with those foundational sort of pieces or something like that, a mix of them. Um, but I really like what's already there. And I think I like that idea of sort of, a, you're sort of answering a question in each of those episodes. Maybe that's, um, I don't know if uh, Deborah, that, that is something you've seen done before in podcasts, but sort of each episode is trying to tackle a particular question mm -hmm. and maybe then that becomes part of the intro that they or the scene that they set up mm -hmm. and that might be a more accessible that, that's a great way. strategy yeah that's a great strategy that's a great strategy i think one of the hard parts for you all is going to be deciding what's in and what's out with respect to topics you know because ideally you want these to be laser focused on accomplishing the aims of the of the alliance and the food system is so interconnected and it's so big and you're all working on different things and it's very easy to get super excited about being able to get somebody on as a guest and talk with somebody. But is that is that in that topic, that person, that concept, that whatever it is that they're going to talk about, is that in or is that out? And, and it will feel awkward at first, but the more that you stay in, the more that that will self-replicate because you, you yourselves will also become more sensitive to, to what's in and what's out. And, and that makes it so much easier for your listeners to really know where you're coming from. Because you're not doing this just to produce a podcast. You're doing this for a specific purpose. And so 
So maybe having conversations as a group, is this in, is this out? I'm not sure about that. How can we make it in? How can we ensure that it's not that you're trying to put words in your guest's mouth, but that you're that you're choosing the right guests and that the conversation is is leading to the right insight that you want people to come to. Yeah, I think I mean that's really important. And those are some of those earlier conversations that we had had as well. You know, there's there's so much work being done on food. There are also so many food podcasts out there that address different dimensions, you know, food and culture, um, even food and health, right? I mean, the food system. And so what is the particular niche that this is focusing on? And I think we keep keep coming back to the rights, not charity. And so I think that's maybe the central piece that no one else is really talking about that much. Um, but we, we sort of almost always have to remind ourselves because like you said, everything sounds so interesting. And at some point, everything is connected. Um, so that's going to be hard, but I like that strategy of, you know, is this in based on our, our goal here, our purpose, or is this out and sort of just sort of making that distinction. Mm -hmm. I have questions too about how you want these to be branded in the sense that there is a, there is a space to be able to have multiple, well, not necessarily multiple because it is pretty small, but is the podcast itself going to have its own unique visual identity? And do we also include like the affiliation, like the university logo of whoever is the host so that it's more comfortable for them to have that on their own personal website, which, you know, in the long run benefits the Alliance because it gets you in more places. But I didn't know whether you'd had that kind of a conversation as a team, like how, how will co-branding help in a way that makes the most sense, that creates the most flexible space possible for you to get the podcast in as many places as possible. I don't think we've had that exact conversation, but I think one of the things that's been raised about the Alliance is that it does create a space where people can say things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to say by virtue of their organizational affiliation. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Alliance also doesn't have a visual identity yet. So we're kind of, this is the yeah. thing, there's a bit of a chicken and egg going on that, um, you know, we're still, we still haven't got a website. We still haven't got the social media. Um, well, when, we launched, when we launched our show, we, we did probably 20 interviews before we launched because I was so concerned about staying on an editorial schedule that I, needed to ha I wanted to have a bunch of them in the can. And so we don't have to wait to do interviews, um, but we, we, we might have to step lightly a little bit until we get some of those other pieces, other places set up so that we know how to post and how to brand and whatnot. But it would be great, I think, if, if we identified the podcast and the alliance, and then of course the person who's the host identifies themselves and their home organization, I think it might make sense for us to have both the visual identity of the host and the alliance on, on those podcasts. Because otherwise, yeah. Like, I think it would be hard for the faculty member to say, hey, can we post this on my departmental page? This is some, some, you know, some, some media that I did. And they'll be like, well, it's not, it doesn't even look like us. It doesn't, it's not branded as us. I, I don't know how I can use that. So we can just avoid that by, by being absolutely open and generous about co-branding and, and putting logos and whatnot on. And maybe that will be kind of specific to everyone's organizations as well and their, their particular role. Um, so we could, we could put that as something that we like need to keep talking about and with each and, and one of the to -do, things on the to-do list for, to be decided before the podcast mm -hmm. is how is it going to be branded according to the host. Um, I did have a quick idea, you know, with, with some of these practices, maybe this is putting too much pressure on the practice, but maybe with some of the practices, we could be thinking or putting out to the rest of the Alliance, would you like to talk for 10 minutes about the right to food or about some of these simple sort of more conceptual things? Um, and we can try recording them and see if they work as introductory pieces with, I think, Suzanne interviewing Paul as the kind of pilot, what's wrong with food charity, I think we'll still, you know, I think he just sort of nails all of those issues but I agree with Rebecca that you know we need to have some of those foundational pieces but I was just wondering if we could kill two birds with a spoon. Oh, um, about killing birds yeah that would be great. <laughs> yeah. um, all right that sounds that sounds good so maybe we could you know ask if people want to volunteer to speak about this topic we could go back to slack and work out what are we missing um, you know what are the foundational things that people need to be able to that we're not that we don't want to assume people understand before we go into the, the nitty-gritty mm -hmm. issues yeah I think that makes sense 
Um, I also wanted to say thank you, Rani, for joining. Um, I know I got your email, so thank you. And I'll send you an email afterwards um, to see if you want to kind of join in in the um, in the process going forward. I haven't. I, I still don't know. Who, uh, S McLeod, does S McLeod work with you at? Is S McLeod still there? Yeah, um, we both work at Food Share. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Edu- What's it? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no worries. I'm an educator at Food Share. Um, I just wanted to ask as well, um, in terms of if there's instances where we ask for interviews with people who are sharing their lived experience, is there um, an opportunity for honorariums for them? Because I know there's members who are part of the the alliance already, but if we're talking to like maybe external people for different reasons, um, is there an opportunity for that? I think there probably is. I think, well, Catherine from um, Parkdale has... um, she's lobbied for a bit of funding from their team to support advocacy that the Alliance is doing to support the communications work. So I think we could definitely put that down as one of the potential expenses. I think we need to have like a wider conversation about what that budget is and, and, and to, to, to be clear about it. But I think that's definitely a possibility. I think that's a good point you raise. Would we need um, to disclose that someone received an honorarium for, for an interview from an ethical standpoint? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm throwing it out there. I, I wonder think, if it's... So, mm, go on, Dave. I think that we would do from the UK because if it's... I'm planning on interviewing somebody who's used a food bank. Uh, if they're receiving universal credit, which is our form of, of welfare support, they would have to declare that to the government. I think a lot of the ways that it's got round is by providing vouchers which raises yeah. its own issues. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty patronizing way of getting around it, but it is one way of getting around the fact that some people have to declare that as income. I don't know how it is in, in North America, but- Are there any attorneys like, in the Alliance? Like, it, it might be good to get just a, a slightly more official ruling on that. My, my gut says that we would need to disclose it, but I'd want someone to say, officially okay i'll put that down as something we really need to like ask thank you for raising that question Ronnie. That's... and it's something we haven't really thought about in deep in depth so if that's something that you're up for for doing as well then we'd be really that would be really fantastic um if you're up for doing some interviewing potentially Oh, um, yeah, I, I'm still very like technically not sound on things. So I'm just kind of like, how do I, I feel like I would have to maybe like do a run through of how comfortable I feel with the tech aspects of it. And yeah, and staying concise. I feel like that's going to be the part where, yeah, so it's, it's just more a, a mindset to shift into. That's where your script will help you a lot. And sticking to it yeah for some of us yeah i share that and we'll have a we'll have a you know our our group as a supportive environment and we've got deborah's fantastic help as well like it's amazing to be able to know that that tech stuff is going to be to some extent sorted for us that's like a huge relief so um but also as Rebecca mentioned, you know, if there are ways that we can take the heat off you, Deborah, like, you know, to, to keep the conversation open about, you know, expectations and, and not trying to overburden people at an already highly pressurized time. But thank you so much for, for today. So, um, I'm happy to brainstorm with you all. And if, if other people do want to try to get into the editing, um, I'm happy to try to assist with that learning curve as best I can as well.